students at the Haven Center for organizing this uh, series. The Haven Center, it's, it's a real pleasure to be back in large measure because the Haven Center is such a unique, or as Americans might say, a very unique place uh, in American academia. Uh, really, there's, it's an oasis for uh, uh, progressive thought in this culture, in academic life today, which, which is almost uh, impossible to replicate anywhere else. Um, I say that only because uh, to prepare you for the fact that this talk is going to be a disappointment at many levels uh, for you. The, the first is that Eric said that the, one of the ambitions of this series is to discuss ways out of capitalism and into socialism. And my talk is going to be rather pessimistic about that, uh, at least with regard to the developmental areas of the world, uh, both in explaining their experience and also where we are currently. But I'm also going to venture out of the developmental areas, the backward, economically backward areas, and give a very pessimistic set of prognoses about chances for socialist transitions in the advanced world as well. So I'm very sorry, let me say right now, for the bad news, uh, but it's, it's God's work, not mine. Uh, I'm just a messenger. <laughs> Uh, the second thing is, in preparing this talk, I have to say, it's the toughest talk I've ever had to try to prepare because, and I complained to the students about this some time back, and they were unyielding, so there was no choice. I, I said, I don't know what to say about, you know, usually when one gives talks, one tries to explain things, and with socialism and development, it's either a prescriptive talk about how the world ought to be, and yeah, I can say anything about that, but there's nothing to, there's nothing to hold on to. Or it'll just be largely uh, an account of what happened in the past, and there too, it's probably stuff you already know. Uh, so, but the students wouldn't change their mind, and so I'm stuck with giving a talk which I'm not sure how much it's going to actually reveal uh, aspects of either the history or the dynamics of the subject which you aren't already aware of. That said, let me give you a sense of where we're headed. The two talks I'm going to give are related to each other. And they're related in the following way. The, today's talk is going to be on what we've seen happen in the world across the 20th century in attempts to meld socialism in a developmental context. That talk is going to be about basically a series of defeats that socialists and the socialist experiment uh, underwent in this context. It's going to end with a, a more pessimistic note to the effect that the defeat has not only been uh, felt across the developing world, but for those people who think the chances of any kind of post-capitalist transit, unless you define post-capitalism the way Eric does, which is incremental, but if you take a post-capitalist transition to be more of a, a leap into a social system with entirely different logics, the advanced world is farther away from that today than, than it was uh, probably 100 years ago which means that we are sort of as progressive, those of us who count ourselves in the anti-capitalist left, we're sort of, um, uh, in, I don't want to say we're back to square one, but we're very far from where we'd like to be. Okay, that's where we'll end today. Tomorrow's talk will take up the following subject, which is, well, if now we have to rethink some strategic, organizational, and uh, political uh, dimensions of the socialist project, how do we do so? Well, one precondition for doing so is to clear away the detritus that's accumulated over the years on the left, and uh, one large heaping pile of nonsense that's accumulated on the left is a body of thought called post-colonial theory. And the, the, the core of tomorrow's talk will be that the, today the face of radicalism in academic life is post-modernist, post-structuralist, and uh, for anybody interested in the developing world, it's a post-colonial theory. That is the face of radicalism. And one of its claims to fame has been to have inherited the mantle of the socialist tradition, tradition which it seeks, which it says not only failed, but had to have failed, because its basic understanding of the world, its basic framework was so fundamentally flawed. What I will do tomorrow is to say that whatever else the socialist tradition's flaws were, it's not what post-colonial theory says they were. And I will offer both a rendering of some of the core arguments of post-colonial theory and then a defense of the basic Marxist framework, at least those aspects which they bring up, against their criticisms. Uh, that is all towards saying that even though we are few in number, lacking power, uh, and uh, lacking organizations, that's no excuse to lack good sense.
and tomorrow hopefully we'll uh, be one step towards uh, building some kind of, at the very least, an intellectual framework to help us move forward. So that's where we are. The Thursday seminar, I don't know what you guys do, but I'll show up and whatever people want to talk about there, we can talk about that. So that said, um, let's proceed with, uh, with today's talk, which uh, is titled um, Socialism Development Cause or Consequence. And that title is to convey a, a kind of, an, uh, I suppose, an irony. Because for socialists in Marx's time, what the connection was between development and socialism was quite clear. Uh, development was to be a precondition to any attempt at socialism. For Marx, uh, the socialism meant, if nothing else, two things. The democratization of not just political life, but also economic life. So that uh, the producers of goods actually had a say uh, through whatever instruments, whatever mechanisms would be developed in what was produced and how it was produced, and, of course, the conditions of its production. So first of all, there would be a democratization of economic life. Secondly, he was quite clear, socialism, it means, if it means anything, means a reduction of working time. So that humans, the, the, he, called, he used the word man, but uh, man's uh, multifold uh, dimensions of, their, of his personality, of, his, of her capacities, uh, could be developed outside the workplace. And whereas Marx considered creative labor to be core to uh, human nature, it's really it's the creative part of it, not the labor part of it, that deserves emphasis here. Laboring activity is, of course, an expression of human creativity, but it is simply one expression. And for Marx, it was quite clear that for the other dimensions of human personalities to develop, it ha would have to occur outside the workplace. Well, both of these things presumed a very high level of development of the productive forces. For the democratization of economic life, planning would be, some, would be necessary in some way. And Marx considered it one of the, uh, the uh, effects of capitalism, the positive effects of capitalism, to have centralized production, to have highly concentrated it in a few hands, to have socialized it through finance, and basically have laid the foundation so that productive units were large enough, uh, had a big enough impact on the economy that a small number of productive, relatively speaking, small number of productive units could be planned and coordinated in a way that had a large impact on the economy. But for economies that were characterized by innumerable peasant producers, small firms, small businesses, it would be m that much harder to plan them. Secondly, the productive forces would have to be quite high in their development in order to minimize production time. Productivity, in other words, would have to be high enough that the working week could be progressively reduced without it having to come at the cost of people's living standards. But if living standards are already so low that people have to spend 10, 12, 14 hours a day just to get by, then there's no question of reducing that working time without a catastrophic drop in their standards of living. So for Marx, it was quite clear that socialism presumed a very high level of development of the productive forces. He took that as, now he wasn't dogmatic about that. And at the end of his life, when Russian populists got in touch with him asking if Russia could perhaps skip over capitalism, he took that question seriously. But he didn't take it seriously in that he thought that the practical dilemmas of a backward country could be uh, ignored or done away with in Russia. He just thought the peasant commune could be a way of actually engineering development in such a way that it could fuse, bring together the positives of socialism and a highly developed economy. Well, he never got very far in thinking about this. But it showed that it wasn't an, uh, simply an article of faith for him, a first principle, that you have to have a high level of development. It was, however, a working hypothesis, and he took it pretty seriously. The dilemma for Marx, and for Engels, and for all socialists of his time, the practical dilemma was a political one. And that was, while we might have some conception of what it takes to make a workable socialism, how do we get there? The politics of socialism was what was at, uh, uh, something of uh, a puzzle for all socialists then. And by the time Engels died in 1894, within the, the socialist uh, uh, political population, there were two paths that were being debated. One was uh, what I think Marx and Engels themselves largely took for granted. Took for granted, I should say. Like, once again, it, ca it, was, it came out of their historical experience. It was not a religious commitment. But what they took for granted that was that the 
proletarian revolution would be sort of like the revolutions of 1848 or 1789. It would embody a ruptural break with capitalism. The other path that was being bandied about, more towards the turn of the century, was one which took seriously the possibility uh, of a more incremental movement towards socialism. And, you, know, you all know this is Edward Bernstein's view. And this was a, both of these paths were de debated and discussed. Neither was really, it, couldn't, it wasn't clear which one was more realistic at the time. And in the event, what happened, of course, was that across the early to mid parts of the 20th century, it was the ruptural path to socialism that seemed to be the one that was more plausible. It was in countries where revolutions took place, where there was a revolutionary break with capitalism, that you saw some attempt at a socialist economy, at socialist organization. But this came with a cost. The first one was that it, it meant that socialist transitions, the countries where political opportunities for socialism were the most ripe, were the most opportune, were the ones where the economic possibilities for socialism were the most forbidding. And so it went exactly against what Marx and Engels had thought would be the necessary condition for socialism to be viable. Now, this wasn't just a historical irony. My view is that it came with, at a great cost. It had a pretty serious consequence. And that consequence was that by the end of the experiment, it was clear that rather than being a precondition for socialism, uh, it was socialism that ended up being a means for engineering development. The causal relation between the two was reversed. There was a consequence that came with reversing this causal relation between the two. And the consequence, I think, was that in the end, the, not just the, uh, the relation between the two, but the actual content of socialism ended up being transformed. And it ended up being transformed, I think, in some measure because of the backwardness of the areas in which it was attempted. What the appropriate causal language is to characterize the relation between the context of socialist transitions, that is, these backward countries, and the ultimate transformation of its content I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and this is something we should take up in discussion. It's not clear to me that there was a ter deterministic relation between the two, in that it was necessarily the case that attempts at socialism in backward countries would generate the outcomes we've seen. But it is, it is no doubt the case that those backward conditions contributed to the outcomes we've seen. How they contributed to those outcomes, I think, is an object of discussion. What I want to do is simply stipulate that there was a causal relation, leave it as a black box as to what its characterization was, uh, what, what its character was, and bring that out in discussion about what I hope. The transmission channels that connected the forbidding economic conditions of backward countries to the eventual outcome were, I think, three. That is to say, I think there were three paths, three routes through which, three reasons that it was backwardness that ended up defeating socialism instead of socialism defeating the backwardness. <coughs> the first was pretty clear. Because of the conditions in which the revolutions took place, and we're talking here about Russia and China primarily, because these were the two countries that have been and were the most influential and the most portentous in the socialist experiment. But the arguments I'm making also cover Eastern Europe, Northeast, uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, and uh, Cuba. In all these countries, because of the conditions in which the revolution occurred, the first order of priority became development, prioritizing simple development over what Marx and Engels had thought would be the main priority, which would be democratization. Because socialism had, was being attempted in countries where the basic challenge was one of simple uh, livelihoods, the first task for all socialist regimes ended up being accelerating the pace of development so as to raise people's standard of living. This meant that planning, socialist planning, took on a very specific hue. It became, plan it became geared not to decentralizing power and decentralizing decision-making per se, 
but to raising the level of aggregate investment in the economy. Now, in backward countries, raising the level of investment cannot mean anything else but lowering or controlling the level of consumption. So first of all, if, raising, if increasing development meant raising the level of investment, it also meant, at least counterfactually, suppressing consumption because national savings had to be geared towards one thing or the other. But of course, suppression of consumption meant what? Pent up demand, shortages, and an incredible demonstration effect coming from capitalist countries, which made consumers in socialist countries constantly aware of the fact that the goods, insofar as the goods were being delivered to them, were both shoddy and fewer in number. Now, this raised a legitimacy issue, which I'll come to in a second. But understand that the shortages and the, the, the um, deprioritization of consumption meant that the state, instead of being downsized, instead of being dismantled, actually had to be strengthened. And it had to be strengthened not just as a planning body, but as an allocated body of consumer goods. Shortages meant necessarily some kind of rationing. The rationing had to be done, or was done, through the state. But precisely because it was done through the state, it also ended up undermining democratic relations because it gave lots of space for patronage, for clientelism, and for corruption. So the prioritizing of development ended up having two drastic effects for the socialist vision. One was it deprioritized many of those components which Marx had thought would be necessary for the development of the human personality. And it gave rise to a state, appar state apparatus in which functionaries got their power by actually maintaining and controlling supplies of goods to the population and set themselves up against the interests of the population. This wasn't purely an, uh, a consequence of the need to increase people's standard of living or investment. Backwardness also figured into this in a, to a second route, which was geopolitics. It made a huge difference that revolutions occurred in backward and weak countries like Russia or Vietnam or China or Cuba and not in countries like the United States or England or Canada for the simple reason that backward countries could actually, the more advanced countries could contemplate undermining the socialist attempts in backward countries through military force. Military force against a country like Cuba or Vietnam is more easily contemplated than if you're thinking of overthrowing, let's say, the French a socialist government in France or a socialist government in the United States. Geopolitics ended up impinging on these countries in a way that it probably would not have happened after the revolutions occurred in the more advanced countries. But precisely because it did, there was no way around the fact that all of these regimes had to devote a large portion of their savings to building up defense. Again, instead of going towards people's consumption or towards the ordinary things that the population would have demanded for its standard of living. Both of these ended up, therefore, creating regimes in which the first priority was investment, not consumption and not leisure. Secondly, after, so the first effect is it prioritizes development above, above all else. As a corollary to this, the second point, it deprioritizes democracy. Now, it's important not to exaggerate this. There were attempts at workers' committees in the industrial sector, at peasant communes, etc. But the point is not that such organizational changes were not made. The point is that when there was a conflict between the increasing productivity or increasing production and deepening democracy, the priority, the antecedent priority to accelerating development meant that the decision would go in favor of production and in favor of productivity rather than in favor of leisure or democracy. Now, this had the effect of increasing the concentration of power within the state, naturally. It added another fillip to increase the increased concentration of power. But the second thing it did was that it changed the state's main source of legitimacy from the imagined one of Marx and Engels, where the source, main source of legitimacy would be extension of democracy into, economy, into the economy. It extended the state's legitimacy, sorry, it, it made the state's main source of legitimacy to be simply increasing people's standard of living or increasing the pace of economic development. This is a slightly distinct point from the one I made earlier. 
The point for the state source of legitimacy, the point that I'm trying to make is that if the source of legitimacy comes from increasing the pace of development, then the state's resources will go towards ensuring that the forms of knowledge that it creates, the organizational resources that it, uh, 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 that it tries to build up, all go towards that end, and not the end of experiments like the Porto Alegre ex experiment in Brazil, which was geared towards a democratization of the budget. The state, if you look at Russian and Chinese uh, intellectual history, and if you look at the, the advances that were made in Russian science, and Russian social science, and Russian economic theory, all their main legacies are technocratic and economic. Economic is what we would say productivist. How you plan better, but plan, what does it mean to plan better? How you raise the level of investment? How you increase allocative efficiency? Not towards how you increase the, uh, how you find ways of dealing with decentralized decision making. Not towards how you disperse power in a planning setting. The main models that they uh, bequeath to us, from Feldman, from Priobrzezinski, these are all highly economistic models. But at least I believe this is a direct consequence of the deprioritization of development, of the states looking at economic logics as being its main source of legitimacy. The third consequence, which I think added to the difficulties of socialism, and which ended up changing the content of socialism, was in the changing conception of political organizations and political parties in these countries. Socialism was supposed to be an organic expression of working class interests. Uh, I know Marx often uses the Hegelian language to talk about this, and it's expressed as a kind of teleology or as an enactment of the master-slave dialectic and all that. And you can do that if you want to, yeah, I suppose, <laughs> publish some articles. But his concern for, uh, his, his insistence on the importance of the working class, I think, was pretty simple. It was twofold. Uh, one was that this is the only agency in capitalism that constantly confronts capital every day. So the, the uh, pursuit of its interests puts it in an antagonistic relationship with the main power center in society. So that's a political reason uh, why he thought the working class is important. Uh, or, and the other was that uh, the working class is in a position to organize itself in a way that leans in a socialist direction. Socialization of its conditions of life and socialization of production are immediately in its own interest. In a way that peasant, if you give peasants their spontaneous demands, they don't gravitate towards socialism in the same way. So for Marx and Engels, for Kautsky, and indeed for Lenin, the understanding up to 1917 of the relationship between a political organization and its social base is one of a kind of fusion. The working class on its own came into conflict with capital and political parties that were parties of this class would develop their ideology and would develop their strategy through the practical experiences of this class. The underlying vision here was that the class would be a check, as it were, an experimental ground, a, 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 a practical uh, experimental ground for the various ideas and the strategic conceptions that the party would come up with. The class, in other words, was to be a sort of check on the party. Now, in the conditions where socialism actually developed, one of two things was always the case. In Russia, it was actually true that the Bolshevik party did develop its strategic orientation and its political ideology largely through its experience uh, within industrial districts. Of all the parties in the uh, pre-revolutionary Russia, the Bolsheviks probably had the deepest roots within the Russian working class. Uh, but by the end of the Civil War in Russia, that part of the class which the Bolshevik party had been in closest contact with and which was the most class conscious, which was the politically the most mature and the most far-seeing, was largely decimated. Those, they had been the volunteers that came into the Russian army. A lot of them were killed off. Uh, a lot of them were simply dispersed. So by the time that the actual building of a, Russian, of a Soviet state starts up, around 1922 or so, the political base of the, the Russian, the Bolshevik party was quite different from what it used to be. And the country had largely deindustrialized. So that's one consequence that socialists in these backward countries had to deal with. A second condition that they had to deal with with regard to the working class 
was that it wasn't decimated so much as they simply had no base in it at all. And here the Chinese experience comes to the fore. Until 1927, the Chinese Communist Party was still largely a working class party. But by the, after they're kicked out of Shanghai and after they're kicked out of the cities through Chiang Kai-shek's pogroms in 1927 and they go to the countryside, they really start becoming a party of the peasantry in terms of their social base. Now what's interesting here is two points. The first is that by the time the Chinese party goes into the countryside, the ideology of socialism has changed to the point where Mao and his leadership isn't all that bothered by this. It isn't all that bothered by the fact that it's now going to be a party of the peasantry. And why is that? I think the roots go back to the Russian experience. And I think what happens with the Russian experience is the Bolsheviks end up making a virtue of necessity. By the time of the 1920s, when the civil war is over, already by that time, the Bolsheviks have ceased to see themselves as an extension of the working class. They now start to see themselves as a patron of the working class. This has important consequences, of course. The main one is that instead of the class being a check on the party, the party sees itself as a check on the class. It sees itself now as the guarantor of the classes, uh, of the integrity and the viability and the acceptability of the demands that the class is bringing up. In practice, what this means is being a socialist party ends up being an expression of an ideology rather than the expression of a connection with a social base. So to what it takes to be a socialist ideology now is hewing to something called a socialist program. But where does the program come from? It now comes from the party. Because the party ends up now being the repository of the correct line, of the truth, of what socialism is. A very different conception of the party than what Kotsky and Lenin had held up to 1914. <laughs> my wife's listening to my lecture. She always tells me when I'm, when I'm, when I'm making a mistake, and this, is, this must be one of those occasions. Why won't it stop? The Chinese Communist Party inherits this tradition, our new tradition. By the time the Chinese leave in 1927, there's something called Leninism. And Leninism by 1927 has become something that's quite different from what Bolshevism, I believe, had been in 1914. So by the time Mao goes to the countryside, he, they would like, I think, to be based in uh, labor, in industrial labor, but they don't see it as uh, a deep flaw that they're not. By the time of the 1960s, of the national liberation movements in Africa, in Vietnam, even this memory is mostly gone. And I think that you see the biggest sign of this in Amilcar Cabral's work in, in uh, uh, Guinea-Bissau. Cabral wrote this book where he says, you know, well, we wanted to be Marxists, we wanted to be socialists, but there's no working class in Guinea-Bissau. So what do we do? And he says, without any real sense of irony, he says, we essentially went out looking for some kind of part of the Guinea-Bissau population who we could call workers. Because once we establish connections with them, we could have legitimacy as a working class party. So it becomes something that mechanical and that tokenistic by the 1970s. The whole conception of a party has now become one of basically intellectuals with the right line, and not organizers of a particular part of the population with particular sorts of interests. The consequence is, first of all, it eases the transition to socialism being an authoritarian ideology, because the party is now seen as the guarantor of everything that's correct, that's desirable. But within the inheritors of the Bolshevik tradition, which by the 70s and 80s, for parties with a mass base in the third world are all Maoist parties. Trotskyists don't, except for Sri Lanka, Trotskyists don't have much of a base. For Maoists, the entire conception of where socialist ideas come from is now very different from what the Second Internationals or the Bolshevik conception had been in the early 20th century. For Bolsheviks and for Kautskyites, the conception of socialist ideology had been that it is an extension of and a fine-tuning of the working class's demands, working class's struggles within the production process. Uh, for Mao and for Maoists, I should say especially for Maoists in the 1970s and 80s, socialism becomes more akin to consciousness raising. 
Well, you can make anyone a socialist. It's just a matter of educating them. Well, the educators, of course, are the party. So now, the fact that you're in backward parts of agrarian countries where you're all your base is a peasantry whose spontaneous and natural demands are not anything that could be in line with a, a socialist state, it's not a problem because you just have to educate them about it. So what this kind of socialism ends up being is a kind of hyper-voluntarism about what is and is not possible. And it's no longer based anymore in a conception of people's interests. It's based really in a conception of consciousness and changing consciousness. And as an aside, I should say, if you look at the intellectual lineage of post-structuralists in the 1980s, they all came out of Maoism. And th this is where it comes from. The, the voluntarism, and the, the, the valorization of agency over structure, the insistence on the importance of ideas, of discourse, this is, it comes out of Maoism. Well, um, the changing conception of the party then ends up having a very a neat and uh, synergistic uh, relationship with the antecedent conditions which I laid out earlier. Because once you've prioritized investment, once you've deprioritized democracy, once you've strengthened the state in order to facilitate all these things, it is a natural marriage between those imperatives and a conception of socialism in which it is the party that's the repository of all things good, not its social base. The consequence was that in really existing socialism by the 1970s, the conception of socialism has basically become technocratic. That it is a plan, an exercise in planning, and its prefer preferability over capitalism is no longer the fact that it will extend democracy into areas that capitalism will never allow. What makes it preferable is that it's more efficient. Cap capitalism is irrational because of the market mechanism, because of the anarchy of the market, and the, the, the superiority of socialism comes from its greater rationality. Well, uh, I think actually this was true by the 50s. I, I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, that there's a difficulty that socialists had to deal with once they started selling socialism on this point which was that it's, it wasn't true. Uh, the, it turns out that capitalism ended up, at least this version of socialism, the socialism we saw in the Soviet Union, in China, in Cuba, in Vietnam, was nowhere near as efficient as capitalism. It is true that from about in, in the Soviet Union and in China, from about 1930 to 1970, their, their economic story is, is uh, quite impressive on a world historic scale, they managed to grow fairly rapidly. But they managed to grow rapidly, I mean, for those of you who study development theory, uh, for the reasons that Arthur Lewis thought development is easy in a backward setting, which is what they were basically doing was they were just putting down new plant and equipment without worrying too much about the efficiency of the plant and equipment. There was all this surplus labor in the countryside. In China, it's still there. And that surplus labor could be sucked up into these factories and show up as huge increases in both production and in productivity. But once you hit the barrier of the labor supply, now GDP had to be increased through increases in productivity, otherwise rising wages would suck up all the resources. This is at the point at which the Soviet economy really faced severe difficulties, and this is the point which the Chinese economy was facing by the late 70s. Uh, and the response on, on the part of both was to opt for capitalism in different ways. In the Soviet Union, they did it by inviting in Jeffrey Sachs and killing off a bunch of their population. In China, they did it through what we're seeing now, which is a kind of market Stalinism. The same bureaucratic oligarchy presiding over a slow privatization of the economy. But the, the belief that socialism would prove superior to capitalism on efficiency grounds so far has not been borne out. Where it did face, experience a great deal of success was in the developing world, not so much to socialists, but to capitalists. Capitalists in the developing world were quite enthusiastic about planning of a certain kind, a certain kind, and this is what I talk about in my book. And what made middle class intellectuals and technocrats in the third world really happy about socialism was they, saw, they took from it tools which enabled them to not have to try a ruptural break with capitalism but which would accelerate the pace of capitalist development in their countries. Um, a personal anecdote, I grew up in a 
unusual set of circumstances. You know, I, I grew up in, in India, uh, and I didn't know anybody who wasn't a socialist till I was 18. And my, whole, my family was very left-wing, and they were all activists and all that. And I remember all the conversations when I was growing up around socialism and all that. And it was all about planning, about the, the importance of planning and the superiority of planning. It, it was rarely about democracy. For progressives in the third world, it was the chance of pushing around capitalists, but without eradicating them, of building a state sector and seeing themselves as the sort of the, 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 the protectors of the state sector, and for accelerating the pace of development. This is what they took away from those lessons. Uh, so the irony is in the third world, socialism ended up being, and socialists, socialist intellectuals, ended up being, and still are, uh, if you, the, the main Indian Marxist today I just characterizes them, I think, to a T. They're the organic intellectuals of a state bureaucracy, not of anything else. So by the 70s, anyway, that, I think, that particular selling point for socialism, the, the history had given the lie to that. Um, its main inheritance then, the main bequeathment of the socialist transition was, I, unfortunately, for much of the world, for the developing world, it was capitalist planning. Not much else. I suppose I'm being a little hyperbolic there, but we can. Uh, there were other, I suppose, uh, legacies that are worth saving, but uh, there, there are few. I think. Um, what socialism ended up being in that part of the world, therefore, was a long road to capitalism. Russia is now capitalist. China might as well be. It soon will be. And Cuba is probably just a matter of time. What about then? Just to add on to the pessimism. Um, I had said in the early 20th century there were two paths out of capitalism that were contemplated. One was a ruptural one, one was an incremental one. What happened to the incremental one? Well, the ruptural one was overwhelmed, I think, by one set of circumstances, which was the backwardness of these countries. The incremental one was overwhelmed by another set of conditions. The incremental path had seen its uh, mission as being one of a gradual taming of capitalism through encroaching on capitalist prerogatives, through parliamentary politics, through the state. This was the historical mission of social democracy, uh, the inheritors of the Second International, the Kautskyan program and the, and the Second International. By the 1980s, social democracy was, it was clear that social democracy had, had given up the goal of actually taming capitalism. It had brought about a different kind of capitalism. But it had also, by the 80s, social democratic parties across the advanced capitalist world had internalized the basic mission of state managers in capitalism, which was to give first order priority to profits and to uh, the interests of their local capitalists. This was true in the 80s. It's far more true now. I think this, this, since the late 90s into this crisis, if you look at the German Social Democratic Party, if you look at French Social Democrats, the British Labour Party, and even the Swedes, the idea of these parties doing anything to upset the apple cart, to actually threaten capitalist interest, is just, it's a laughing, uh, it's laughable right now. The German Social Democratic Party is a kind of a third way, Blairite, soft neoliberal party. I don't know that much about what the Swedes are doing, but uh, from what I gather, it's not too pretty. Both models, therefore, out of capitalism right now, are, shall we say, in abeyance, uh, if not uh, in outright defeat. Well, uh, I have one more pessimistic thing to say, but it actually it ended up being a longer talk than I expected. Uh, let me just say a final thing. So what this leaves, this leaves open is the possibility of marrying the two. A ruptural break from capitalism occurred in the most backward countries. An incremental path of capitalism was tried in the advanced countries. Both failed. Perhaps one way out is to try to bring the ruptural path out of capitalism into the advanced countries. I think for the, the Eric's generation of leftists, that is the new left, the, the part that co considered itself a revolutionary left, or this is the hope to which they've held on, I think. Um, and it's a good one. Uh, I'm fully supportive of it. I, I just don't think it's anywhere on, on the horizon. <laughs> What's happened in the 20th century was the, the countries which developed capitalism also underwent two other changes. Uh, that capitalism became one that is quite hegemonic. It's a capitalism that has 
uh, that is unlike Russian capitalism and Chinese capitalism, which have no real base of support within the population. These countries do. Organizing, therefore, in these countries is no simple task. And Gramsci realized this back in the, the 20s. But even more importantly, alongside the development of capitalist economy was the development of the capitalist state. And the, to contemplate the breakdown of the state, either a political breakdown or a logistical breakdown right now, is, I think, something of a fantasy. Uh, there's revolutions, you know, you don't flip a switch and make a revolution. They, they're sort of like earthquakes. They kind of happen. Or at least the main conditions which allow for revolutions to happen, one of which is the breakdown of the state. You can't engineer that very easily. And uh, the states in the Atlantic world, at least, don't, I don't see any circumstances in which that breakdown is on the cards right now. Um, given the greater, the deeper social base of these states than the Russian and the Chinese, given the greater strength of these states, I mean, if you look at Libya right now, Gaddafi is holding on to power simply through, I and mean, this is Libya, this isn't even Egypt, it's just through military force. And he has a ragtag army that he's able to hold on through military force. One imagines if the British or the American state were trying to hold on to power, what they would be capable of. That, so that being the case, I think a ruptural logic within advanced capitalism really sort of right now is, is more of something you talk about in a cafe or in a seminar room. It's not really a practical political program. Which means where we are right now uh, is uh, not, in, not in a good place. I, I'm not going to end with a way out or something like that. I think that's, I don't have any more knowledge of that than anybody else over here. But I would think that the first place to start is with a very frank assessment of, of where we are. And I think this is where we are right now. Tomorrow I'll give you some reason to feel that uh, even though the, these varieties of socialist experiments failed, uh, there's still something to be said for the underlying social theory that generated them, which is Marxist theory. Uh, and I'll do that through a defense of, uh, through Mar of some versions of Marxist theory against post-colonial criticisms. Okay. I, I don't, I, I, as long as, for me, the basic problem in the developing world is the agrarian question. I, I don't, it's so hard to imagine an actually a viable socialist uh, economy or political system when half the population is smallholders. And if you try to do land, you know, collectivize them in some way or set up communes or something like that, it, it's just, it's never been successful anywhere. So, you know, you look at Brazil, and Brazil looks great in so many ways, other than the fact that Lula's, you know, Lula's become what he is. Uh, even if Lula were to go back to his 1990s program and try to be revolutionary, I, I don't know how you take care of the agrarian question in a way that doesn't turn the population against you. So there, you know, capitalism solved a lot of these problems for people in the West, and uh, it, it's not that capitalism has failed. It, it's, a, it's a consequence of capitalism that smallholders are still there. It's a, it's a, it's a dimension of uneven development. I can't talk about that here, but. So I think the incremental road in, in the developing world is towards social democracy. Now, wow, if you have social democracy in Egypt, that's a historic achievement. So I, I'd be very happy. There's some parts of the world in the South where social democracy is a huge leap forward, right? But we should be clear that what that is, that is a form of capitalism. It's not socialism. <clears throat> Yes. Well, then what, what would your definition of socialism be? Yeah, I, that, I mean, that's a good question. And, you know, I, I think it's, uh, okay, so my view, socialism, you have socialism when production is no longer organized around profit. So when, when it, it's, it's not planning per se, I think that's socialism. I think capitalism has a great deal of planning within it right now. But so long as the production and distribution of goods and uh, the main institutions in society have to submit to the logic of profits, then you're still in capitalism. And I think this is true. This is where maybe I differ a little bit with Eric on this. I don't think there's any social democracy where, as a basic stylized fact, you can say that prioritizing profits has been done. I mean, you can find pockets where it has within any capitalist economy. But the economy itself is organized. So what socialists used to say back in the day, it's people before profits. I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah. One of the uh, previous speakers. Um, Could you tell me your name? Pardon? Could you tell me your name? 
Alan. Alan? Yes. Uh, one of the previous speakers, um, I, I don't recall what his name, maybe it was Duncan, who spoke about oh, yeah. um, a competition. <coughs> he emphasized cooperatives, and he, his vision, if I understood it correctly, was a gradual um, increase in the number of cooperatives which would then compete with capitalistic enterprises and perhaps outcompete capitalistic enterprises and move in a socialistic direction um, according to that realm. Yeah, I mean, in principle, it's never been done. There have been these parts of certain countries where cooperatives have done very well for themselves, and there's a lot of literature on them. But um, you know, when you're talking about cooperatives outcompeting capitalism, the difficulty, the only difficulty with that, and I'm perfectly happy to be wrong on this, the only difficulty with it is that you have to end up internalizing a lot of the same priorities and decisions that capitalists would make in order to be to outcompete them, in order to do better than them on the market. The essence of socialism is supposed to be that you really prioritize your other needs over efficiency or at least you're willing to do so. I don't believe that socialism, if it ever happens, should be a zero growth economy. I think it's important. It's not just necessary, but also morally important for there to be some kind of growth. Because I think a lot of good things come out of growth. But I, I do think that you, you're not going to get to socialism if you're prioritizing growth above everything else. So I'm, I'm kind of skeptical about it. But you know, the world is a strange, multi-dimensional and wondrous place So I could be. Pat, speaking as somebody from a benighted part of middle America where I never met a socialist until I was 18, <laughs> uh, and therefore have lower expectations perhaps, uh, except during the New Left era, the most fascinating thing about Wisconsin in the last three months, and the way I've been able to speak about it in various places, to my own amazement and interest in students and other people, is that the defense of the social state over and above the perceived needs of capital reached such a level of intensity and well, everything else everybody in this room marched around so that I don't have to elaborate at all so that it seemed to uh, place uh, human needs far above uh, profits or even efficiency defined by somebody or other and in that way raised a prospect that we had foreseen in that fashion, uh, which seems like a really remarkable and perhaps very promiseful development. That's uh, one point if you have any interest to comment on it. The other one is uh, any comments you have about uh, uh, revolutions and proto-revolutions across uh, much of the Middle East and those things. Okay, I'll try. As for the first one, I couldn't agree more. This is, I mean, but you know, I think movements do this all the time, especially when in times of when austerity is being imposed on working people. A very natural reaction is for people to say, "Screw you and screw your profits. You're taking away my basic livelihood, here, right?" Uh, and you saw that in Wisconsin. I think you, you've seen this everywhere, and it expresses the most important impulse there is in left politics. I think, and you know, um, there's been this historic divide between and be to anarchists and socialists on a variety of issues, but this is a very powerful and positive impulse in the anarchist tradition, which is to say, we may not have the solutions right now, but we do know what we don't want. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna stop everything until we get something different. And it's not our responsibility to figure everything out, you do it. I think that's positive. And I'm actually quite in favor of at least that aspect of it. Um, the Arab revolutions right now, uh, I think it's an interesting, question. Um, I don't think they're revolutions, first of all. Uh, I think they're uprisings, and my sense is that uh, there's no reason to be optimistic about any of them at the moment, including the Egyptian one. Right? From the looks of it right now, the Egyptian army has managed to outmaneuver the uprising. Um, and I think that it speaks to some of the positive lessons we can take from the socialist experience of the 20th century. I, I mean, I felt my, I mean, I, I, I saw myself issuing a lot of cliches during uh, February, March, April, witnessing what was happening in Egypt, uh, 
but there were cliches that I think are largely true. And one was that the absence of a, a left and the absence of political organizations inside Egypt they absolutely destroyed what could have happened. If you take a, an uprising like the Egyptian uprising, had it occurred in a country with an actual communist party, and small c, right? Not the, the Stalinist ones, but an actual socialist party. Actually. And if in early April or something, in Tahrir Square, when everyone's just kind of standing around saying, well, now what do we do? If you had a political party that had said, we actually have a program, and here we have a cabinet ready, and we, we know what we can do with the army, it would have galvanized people in a way that was that didn't actually happen. And in, what in, in, ended up happening was that the, the most organized force in Egypt ended up finding a way of saving its ass, which was the army. And right now it looks like it will probably be successful in doing so. It's still a massive step forward for Egypt, I think. I think Egypt will probably end up being some kind of, some kind of um, quasi-authoritarian democracy, probably like Turkey. Uh, but that's something. In the others, I think the chances are much worse. I think all of them are, are good developments, but I think the fact that in, in all of these countries for 40 years, any progressive forces were decimated, killed off, destroyed, has meant that when opportunities occurred for a really progressive change, there are very few social forces in a place to take advantage of them. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, well, I wanted to push back on some of your pessimism toward the end. Um, and so the first, you had two parts, right? And the first part about the social base in countries like the United States of capitalism. I actually wasn't sure whether you meant ideologically or materially. Um, but it does strike me that one thing for Marxists in our broad tradition to grapple with historically is that the period of the last great radicalization of our country was in the midst of a very prolonged economic boom that, you know, I think, you know, our, our political tradition had not predicted, um, was not expected to be as sustained as it was, and so on. Um, and, and that has, I think, pretty profound consequences in terms of a layer of the United States, at least, a, a, a pretty big section of the white working class having a kind of plausible, path forward. It seems to me that from the 1970s on, that's actually a completely different story in the way that some of the effects of that have been deferred in terms of how it's felt in people's lives, but certainly the deferment is also now mm. coming to a halt as well. So one question is about, you know, can you spell out more what your argument is about the base in the United States? Um, and then I was also, just, I think about the, <coughs> The revolutions in the Middle East. I mean, I think here it's the right question to say what could things have looked like with a larger socialist movement in Egypt. Um, although I'm actually less pessimistic than you are there, because it strikes me that I mean I, I don't have a very positive assessment of this particular moment. But it did that, I guess my overall sense is that it's still much more open in terms of what might develop there than I think you're saying. But you know, it's just interesting to me when you're talking about Libya, you say like this isn't even Egypt in terms of the ability of the state to repress people. But so why was the outcome so much more positive in Egypt? Well, partly it's a question of the state strategy, but I also think it's because even the level of organizing among the working class that there was in Egypt, the level of trade union struggle, low as it was, actually was extremely significant in terms of the ability to repel Mubarak's forces at crucial moments. Um, and so, I guess I want to push back on your pessimism about state repression as well. Okay, let me start with the first, the first point. I, I guess what you're saying is that since the 70s, there's been such a, um, it's been such a difficult period for working people in the United States, with stagnating wages and with no benefits and all the attacks on their benefits and all that, that it might be a mistake to think that there's a, the, the legitimacy of the economic system. Uh, it goes all that deep with them. And um, there's a dimension of that that I think is true, depending on how we understand the concept of legitimacy. So certainly they think that the game is rigged. I think that's true. And I think that they also think that the, a lot of what they're told is, is simply not true about the American dream and all that business. But at the same time, 
the there's a big difference between the 1930s and now on the political dimension, which is that in the 1930s, you know, the a big chunk of the working class was recent immigrants from Europe who had trade union experience and who came out of the left. It's not immediately them that they were just one generation away. But the other one was that working class America had a really, they had a left culture. They were socialists, they were communists, they were anarchists, and they were embedded in these communities. You know, I had this argument with Fran Piven about a few months ago when the crisis hit, and she said, well look, in the 30s, there were all these spontaneous uh, movements around housing, to defend housing and all that. And I said, well, okay, how did they occur? And she said, well, there were communists who were, and it's not spontaneous, right? So one big difference is that back in the 30s, there was not just a layer, but there was an embedded community of or working class intellectuals and organizers. Right when in the 30s? Hmm? Right when in the 30s? In the 20s and 30s. The, 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 the organizing that came out of something, it wasn't literally a spontaneous explosion. In the, right now, the, the, the big difference is that it's gone. And you see that in the ease with which workers' actions come up and then dissipate. And you see that in the demands that they're making. They're kind of, they're inchoate, and they, they're easier to suppress and to sideline. I think that's a dimension of legitimacy, because the the, the ideological parameters within which they're functioning are ideological parameters set up by capitalism. They don't break out of it. I don't think I, I don't think I disagree with you. Therefore, I think we're focusing on two different things. I, I think sociologically, you're right about the level of dissatisfaction, anomie, and all that business. But there's a big difference between simply feeling unhappy and having a way of conceptualizing the roots of that unhappiness and the ways out of it. As for the Middle East. Um, Sure, it's, I mean, that's why the Egyptian uprising is positive, because it is more open. So your characterization of it being open is correct. But, you know, history doesn't stand still. Uh, the army and the Egyptian bourgeoisie and the state isn't going to wait around for Egyptian, the poor and working people in Egypt to get their act together. They're going to set up parameters on what can be established. And you know, Patrick wrote this great dissertation on the, the importance of the Chilean experience in this regard, because it, the Chilean neoliberalism didn't just end up putting a new economic model in place. There was a 20-year-long effort to make sure that the left can never take power again. What the army is doing now, and what the Egyptian elite is doing now, is trying to make clear that by the time, if some kind of left party in Egypt starts up, and if it gets a mass base, there's going to be real obstacles in its way. I think that one can respect and be appreciative of all the struggles that they're undertaking and everything they're trying to do, that is the Egyptian left, to take advantage of the opening they have, but still be very clear that the opening that they did have is going to be very hard to bring up again those days in, in March and April. As for my contrasting of Libya and Egypt, I might have been, uh, you might have misunderstood. What I was saying was the Libyan state has nowhere near the repressive capacity of the Egyptian state, and yet look what, what Gaddafi is able to do. And so I was simply saying that the Libyan state is far inferior to the Egyptian state. The Egyptian state doesn't even begin to measure up to the American state. So it's on that basis. I mean, how many cameras are there in New York City on every street? I just sometimes I think about this. I don't think there's a single movement I make out in the open in New York which is not monitored by somebody. That's why all these people like to talk about Foucault. Because that shit just makes you crazy. It's incredible. They know everything you're doing all the time. So, Organizing in these conditions for anything like a ruptural break is just, we can't even begin to imagine the, what that means. That's why I said it's, it's cafe talk more than anything else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can we come back to you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Matt? Well, okay, so not that cafe talk is without value, but so let me, I want to go back to the, the historical. Um, lesson teacher, because it, I mean, it seems like, as opposed, the logic is ironclad, you know. No, yeah, logic. that's why I said it early on. I, I yeah, no, sure. yeah. Okay, well, well, I want to draw out some of the contingency, yeah. because, I mean, for one thing, the folks who talk about ruptural strategy in Russia, we're also thinking about 
that has a link in a you know process on corruption strategy in the advanced world, right? Yeah, so it seems like you're telling the story from the point of view of the ultimate victors. Um, in that, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, a bureaucracy that's committed to a sort of nationally, nationally delineated process of development, industrialization, expensive consumption. But that was that was one thread of a debate. I guess I'm, I want to have you tease out. Um, you know, I don't think you think that that was some inevitability. But, then, but that raises the question that was posed directly by the agents themselves. Can we spread this thing? How we break out of the ironclad logic is, can we get some of the resources of the advanced world? Can we convince people in these imperialist countries Wait, no, man, us? but now you've said two different things. Mm -hmm. You seem to start out saying that there wasn't an ironclad logic to Russia turning out the way it was, which is different from saying there wasn't an ironclad, ironclad logic to Russia turning out the way it was had the revolutions in the rest of Europe actually succeeded. I, I, I meant the latter, I guess what I was asking. Is well, that, you see, was the that latter, I think, is a more okay. contingency, or, or no, is that really as, no, as no, much of course. a sort of uh, pipe dream as, as today? It, 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 you know, obviously. If there's a revolution in Germany, if there's a revolution in Italy, then everything changes. Right. Yeah. Uh, I thought your objection was, I, I thought you were saying that my argument seems to draw out the conclusions from the fact of the ruptures. So that I seem to be saying that ruptural transitions in backward, in backward settings will lead to these outcomes. Uh, as opposed to ruptural uh, breaks with capitalism without assistance from the West coming in. Of course, uh, I don't think there's anything at the back of a rupture that, that gives you these eventual outcomes. On the other hand, uh, you know, I don't want to cover my ass on this too much. I should stick my neck out. I don't see any way that the Soviet Union had, could, could have turned, the Russia could have turned out socialist without, you know, ruptural or incremental. That is, I don't think, I don't think it's the fact of a ruptural break that gives you Stalinism, that gives you this, this whatever you want to call that state. But uh, I do think the backwardness, the best we could have hoped for in Russia was a kind of an, a, a progressive social democracy. I, I can't see how 80% peasants population who do not want to give up their land. They just don't want to do it, right? No, I, I agree. I mean, that, that, that's why I actually said so, the ironclad is not that far fetched. Once you conceive of these things in isolation, and Marx was you know, pretty much right about that. Um, I, I just want to tease out the contingency in the actual situation, which wasn't confined. The, the contingency is not with respect to the failure of socialism. The contingency is with the forms of state and the, the degeneration of the political culture and political life that one saw. And this is a difficult thing to think about. For example, I don't think it was a mis I don't think anybody in practical politics who is given a chance at taking state power can refuse that chance. So I don't think the Bolsheviks were wrong in taking state power. You have to be crazy. It just means you're not serious if you refuse it. So the question isn't should they have taken state power. The question is what should they have done with it. Yeah, there. Well, especially once the revolution didn't occur elsewhere. Because at the moment of seizure, the 20s, yeah. at, at the moment of seizure, there was still perhaps an illusion, but at least an open possibility. Oh no, it wasn't an illusion. No, I'm saying. I mean, anybody in their right mind. Right, so say, take, yeah. Germany, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So. Depending upon how fragile you see the whole yeah. European structure, but certainly in the context of the end of the First World War, there was plenty of reason to believe that maybe the throw of the dice was worth it because there was real possibility. But once that was defeated, then there really was a choice about saying, yes, we gambled on this and we lost, and therefore the best we could do is, for example, what appears to have been attempted with the new economic policy, and then build that into a new form of more status capitalism right from the start, rather than attempting the collectivization of the other strategies. Um, well, I do think one lesson that comes out, I, I think, I think Nicaragua, despite what happened in the end there, was an important lesson. It's not just the NEP that one needs to go back to, but you have to keep in mind, while the NEP is being implemented in Russia, the secret police is still there, no freedom of the press, no opposition allowed. So I think that component of Russian political culture at that time yeah, it has to be rejected. I think for anybody today dealing with thinking about progressive experiments and backward in any country, but this will be felt most of all in, more, in the poorer countries because of the ease with which advanced countries can 
can attack them. I think the Nicaraguan experiment showed one thing, that Russia didn't face the kind of counter-revolution that the Nicaraguan one you know, with The Nicaraguan one was probably even more ambitious than the Russian one. And Nicaragua kept an open press, and they allowed for a democratic constitution, and they survived it. You know, my own view is that Sandinistas lost the elections not because of American uh, efforts, etc., or the, the old elites. It was because they screwed up. They, they became more authoritarian with their base than they ought to have been. For me, the, I think the, the important lesson to take out of this is not so much the NEP. I think the economic question is a practical question, and you always try to minimize market as much as you can. And perhaps in other countries, like in Brazil or something, today you could move, you could have a more ambitious economic program than the Russians had in the NEP. I think the important side is the political one. I don't think, I think if you're going to use the counter-revolution as an excuse to shut down political life, then you should just give up the game. Because you, it's no longer the revolution you have. And that there is the, is the contingency for me, Matt. I feel that backwardness can't explain the level of repression in Russia. I think that came about due to ideological and political weaknesses within that tradition. This is why my view is what we call Leninism is a dead end. I think Bolshevism, and the, the experience of the Bolsheviks is very important. You learn from it, you build on it, but what we know is Leninism, which is basically Leninism is what happened after 1918. Uh, the, the, the talk I gave here today was basically it said this, that whole model of socialism that came out of the Second International, and you know, there's this recent work by Lars Lee, which I think shows this beautifully. Lenin was a Kautskyite. Lenin broke with Kautsky because he thought Kautsky ceased being Kautsky. And what we've seen in the 20th century was an experiment around socialism through two Kautskyite parties. The social democracy in Western Europe, the, the party form of social democracy comes straight out of that, that 1908 in Germany. That and the Leninist party, I think they're both basically dead. And what the, it's the political lessons of both of those that have to be taken seriously. Yes? Can, can I follow up on a question of authoritarianism? I'm, I'm a Latin American historian, and so I look at this lens, at this, these issues through the lens of Latin America. And from my perspective, it is instructive that Cuba imposes an authoritarian system and survives. And part of it is that I don't see that the threat is from democracy, and by that I mean from the public in general. And you see this very much <coughs> right now in Latin America with the with move for 20th century socialism, which is a whole other issue, but the, but the ongoing threat is the oligarchy that does not play by, by the rules that we laid down. And, uh, and if perhaps more clearly than anywhere, we see that in Chile, don't we, in 1973, where, where, where it, the, the oligarchy uh, persists and will use any tools at their disposal in order to overthrow a move to socialism. And so this does become a whole conundrum, and the way that Cuba survives is by physically eliminating the oligarchy. And my interpretation of Nicaragua would be the reason that the Sandinistas don't survive is not because of, of um, uh, there, there are problems, uh, there are ongoing problems, but also in the 1980s, Nicaragua had a complete flourishing of, uh, I mean, what people would say in Nicaragua in the 1980s is that the Sandinistas unleashed the tongues of the people, and now they just wish they shut up already, because everybody was, because there was this whole flourishing on a popular level of, of popular expression. Um, but we do see this persistent problem that, th that there is this reaction by a very small, but still very powerful uh, oligarchy, and how, from a socialist perspective, how do you uh, check that, those authoritarian responses without uh, repression? Well, you know, there has to be some repression. When you have an active attempt to overthrow your state, there's gonna to have to be some repression. The fault of these regimes is not that they used repression against the counter-revolution, but that everything is the counter-revolution for them. And, and my view is simply this, that are you committed to the regime surviving or the democratic aspirations of the revolution surviving? And if you're committed to the regime surviving, then I think it's legitimate to say that we did what we had to do. I don't know, I mean, and that's not to minimize, it's important that Cuba today has incredible education system, great healthcare and all, I think that's great. But I can tell you right now, it's not gonna survive. 
it, these regimes just don't survive. And the, the reason is bread and water in the end isn't enough for people. It's, they need it, they deserve it. But in the end, they want certain liberties. It, I believe it's a part of human nature. So the, the, the question for all these regimes is, you might buy a few years, a few decades for yourself if you use a repression against your entire population. But A, it's no longer what you were trying to build. And B, I don't think it's about. But then you find an analyst perspective direction where you never achieve anything. No, I think you have to find a different way, which so my whole view, my view, what I'm trying to, perhaps I miscommunicated. I don't think you capitulate. I don't think you give up and say, well, since we can't use, since we can't have a totalitarian state, there's no, we can't win. I think you say that the totalitarian route is unacceptable. We're going to have to find a more democratic way of doing this. And my, that, it might be easy to say. But I don't know what the appropriate counterfactual is to yours. So, you know, it's often said about Cuba, Cuba survived because of its authoritarianism. Are you sure? Are you sure it couldn't have survived without? I don't know. And in Chile, well, it's that you're absolutely right. The, and I think, in my view, I think that there are three great revolutions in the 20th century, the Chinese, the, the Russian, and the third was the Chilean. Because it's, the, Allende was the first and last social democrat to take Bernstein seriously. That he really took it seriously. I'm gonna use the electoral vote to get, not just to achieve state power, but to try to get to socialism. I think he's the only one that ever did. Uh, and look what he got in return. So you're absolutely right. But I don't know if the answer to that is that he should have done what Castro did. Because that is a gambit that's going to fail in the end as well. This is why I'm pessimistic. I, I'm pessimistic only in the sense, and maybe pessimism is the wrong word. I'm just humbled by this. I think this is, a, this is what we have to figure out now in the 21st century. You know, if, if Canada goes socialist tomorrow, I don't think America will invade it. But any country in South America, any country in the Middle East, many countries in Southeast Asia have to face up <coughs> to this problem. My view is that if, what the 20th century showed is that the Cuban route or the Chinese route is not, you know, is not the way to deal with it. Yeah, Alan, uh, Alan I think, yeah. Yeah, I want to go back to something kind of moved by. as the geopolitical. Uh, because we hardly talk here about that. And I kind of agree with you, but let's put some layers on the pessimism. Uh, that is the um, war of imperialism. Uh, certainly war defined those attempts, the, the earlier attempts, uh, not only back in this, but devastation of, of imperialism. Uh, and, and secondly, the I guess I'm talking about imperialism in, 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 in the largest sense of the imposed global austerity at this point, uh, however you want to describe it, neo, neoliberal or whatever, this accumulation uh, upwards as putting one more impediment, uh, on, you know, even in those places where there are left parties, like in, well, in, in Western Europe, for instance. Uh, it's, it's just devastating now. And, and then, of course, I'm, I'm surprised Paul just left it and commented on, on the other, uh, the ecological, the environmental crush uh, that's certainly in the global south at this point. Yeah. I, I'm not so sure about the ecological point. I, I think there's one issue, one way to deal with the ecological problem. The, the fastest way to, do, to deal with it is by, my, my colleague Greg Albo says this, and I think he's, he's totally right. The, the best transitional program towards a, more, a, a kind of a socialist ecology is just to do what the left has been saying for 30 years, which is public transportation, public housing, you know, the traditional left demands. If you just put those in place, you cut down all this stuff hugely. Secondly, if you have, a, you know, if you, I think the only way to deal seriously with the ecological problem is through some kind of very ambitious social democracy or a non-capitalist economy, because if you try to actually dismantle the coal complex and the petroleum complex, and that means you have to find jobs for literally hundreds of thousands of unemployed workers, and you can't do that in a decentralized market system, right? Uh, the, the global the economic system, Alan, I, I think you're right. 
And this is another reason for pessimism about, again, we should be clear. You can have all kinds of progressive uh, policy packages and progressive transitions in the developing world, but socialism, we, we, I want to hold on to that ambition of socialism. You know? That's a... If I could just make it an image. You, you, you continue to treat socialism and capitalism as binaries, so that you've got full-blown capitalism, fully intact, with all of its dynamics, ruling everything, or socialism, as opposed to a view that co economic structures are complex, interconnected, and internally contradictory systems in which socialist and capitalist elements and forms are combined, and what, in fact, having massive public transportation and public housing and the powers necessary to do that, what that does is erodes the autonomy of capitalist allocations. And it's a less capitalistic capitalism as a result. Uh, and that the hybridization is, I mean, one, one vision of the what you're calling incremental, or it could be viewed as metamorphosis, is that through hybridization, the constraints on the <coughs> autonomous allocation of resources in response to profit opportunities gets narrower. The space for that gets narrower and narrower as allocations are authoritatively or democratically allocated elsewhere. Yeah. Now, this is true. I mean, this is true conceptually, Eric, but if you look historically, if these were actually hybrids, you should see, at least in principle, you should see the possibility of movements in either direction. No, but in all these countries, the movement has been towards in one direction. I don't, first of all, I don't think that's true. I think it, it depends on what you're measuring to, to, to decide whether it's true that it's always in one direction. What's, what's the criterion for that? The proportion of human time that's being allocated capitalistically? No, the purpose, no it's that the, in all these countries, the movement has been towards the dismantling of the public sector well, against the private sector. Right. Which means that the social power of the public, at least those... The it's not, it's not so simple. The dismantling, first of all, has been, the rhetoric of dismantling has been vastly greater than the actual dismantling to begin with. If you look at measures like the percentage of GDP that's uh, managed by the state as opposed to by private investors. Uh, some places it's been larger than others, and some places it's been relatively modest. If you look at the amount of social time, the total amount of time people spend doing stuff that's organized directly capitalistically versus in other ways, uh, there's no general trend in the developed world for that to become ever more capitalistic. Um, yeah, no, I'm out, I, I, yeah, no, I'm talking about the developing world. No, no, I'm but, talking about, you know, we're, yeah. so I, I think there's more indeterminacy, and I agree with you that the ruptural strategies, as you know, the ruptural strategies seem totally implausible, but the only thing we've got to work with is some kind of metamorphosis strategy. I, I don't, and I, and I think those strategies have to get away from a binary view, otherwise they're totally implausible. I mean, the only plausibility is if you have some notion of hybrid systems where you can build alternatives. And partially that then means not thinking that all the alternatives have to be through the state. I don't see that there's a implausibility that comes with, you know, so let's just be real. Marxists always had a binary view. <coughs> But it's the Marx, the people with the binary view that built these hybrid societies you're talking about. So I don't know where the, if the implausibility you're saying is that it makes it seem as if nothing is achievable. That's oh, no, I think, I, oh, no, I, I think you can, yeah, I'm not saying that the view is what that is. I'm saying that the, the world itself is not binary. I agree, you can have a, you can have a binary view in non-binary things, of course. I don't mean that. I just meant what's actually happening in the world is interstitial to use one of my favorite terms, and, uh, and thinking through the ways in which that could be expanded is part of the rethinking of what uh, transformation can consist of. And, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that that's, that I, obviously that I have a scenario for systemic transformation through the accumulation of such changes. It just seems there's more plausibility thinking along those lines than there is so that's what I was saying when I said you can have all kinds of progressive capitalism. But we're talking about the same thing, which is attacking different words. Except what renders them progressive is that they become less capitalistic. Yeah, I, I, that's fair. You know, as opposed to that they're just as capitalistic as any other capitalist system, it's just that they're also progressive. I think it renders them less capitalistic and therefore more vulnerable, rather less vulnerable than subsequent change. Because the mix of social relations and social practices is already less purely competitive, profit-driven, individualistic, and market-based. Yeah, I think it's more public, you know, more libraries. That's the 
No, it's not the libraries. No. This is where we. It's, well, it's one of one of the more Wikipedia, no, more but, libraries. What matters is whether or not the changes you've made actually take away power from capitalists. And a library just doesn't. I mean, you, I'm sure you'll come up with an argument that it does, but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> You said that play is not definitely is not socialism character. What is not its character? Plan, plan, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mean that Swiss, Switzerland, French, and other West uh, uh, West world maybe is uh, is not socialism, it's just capitalism. So uh, this man is thinking about economic mechanics because there's two uh, mechanics. Uh, mechanics uh, in the world. Uh, one is play economic system, and the other is market system. Yes. So if you don't agree, play is uh, uh, main practical socialism. What's uh, uh, say something about uh, what do you think? What's main practice of socialism? Do you think? Or, or, or what say mm. something about it? And uh, the other question is about you. You speak uh, of uh, Chinese companies, so I want to know how do you think about uh, China's system? Um, do you think this, it uh, uh, it, it uh, socialist or capitalist or other things? So. Yeah, the difficulty with answering these questions is it all depends on how you define these concepts. Right? Uh, so, th I think you're, you're right to, 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 to fasten on an ambiguity in what I said. It, it does seem bizarre to say that socialism, that planning is not socialism, or that socialism is not planning. Um, it's, it's bizarre, but I think it's true. In that, I, the, the mere fa it, it all depends on what we mean by planning. So, if by planning we simply mean that the investment decisions are coming through directives from political bodies, and they're not lived, they're left to the, the whims or the decisions of actual holders of property. That kind of planning, substantial to a substantial degree, has been carried out within capitalism itself. Secondly, uh, planning, it's quite clear that in the Soviet Union, the main allocation of goods came through some kind of planning mechanism. And that was also true in China up to 1978, at least. Now, the question is, do we want to call that socialism? If you define socialism so that socialism is just planning, then by definition, that is socialism. But if you define socialism in a normative way, that is, as something that you would like to see, perhaps in a way that Marx thought of it, then it's clear that while any form of socialism will have to involve planning, you can have planning-based systems which are not socialist, because socialism will be planning of a certain kind. In other words, planning plus A, B, and C. That A, B, and C is missing in both Russia and China, in my opinion. If you don't agree plan, it's not true. Yeah. What's, what's the main character of socialism? No, so that's, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So I, I do think socialism will have to have planning. But it'll have to be planning that's different from the kind of planning we've seen in... And in my view, socialism will also have to have some markets. So I, I, I don't see any reason to believe you can ever have a fully planned economy. And Eric and I had a conversation about this a few months ago, and he made the point, I think correctly, that you should not probably, you shouldn't want to see a fully planned economy. That there are some things that markets do which are probably good thing. I think I agree with that. So I think socialism will have some markets. But there's no doubt about the fact that I think the bulk of investment decisions will have to come through planning in socialism. So, there, so th that will be the main mechanism in socialism. It'll just be different from the way it was done in, in China and the Soviet Union. Now, what's my view of China? I think it's, it's a highly authoritarian form of state capitalism. It's, it, that is, it has a very large state sector, but it's organized 
the economy itself is increasingly organized around profit-driven lines. And it's by, it's, we, I don't think anybody should want to call that socialist, whatever it is. I mean, if somebody wants to, they're free to. We'll just invent a different name for what we want. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, I think it's, uh, the authoritarianism is obviously clear.